Hi, and welcome to Preparing for Success in a Post-COVID-19 World with Blockchain Technology. I'm George Levy, and I will be your instructor. This event is presented by University Canada West, and it's powered by Blocks EDU. I'm very excited to be able to present this information for you. Uh, right now, I am going to be keeping the camera on, so, uh, so you realize I am here, and this event is going to be a very exciting opportunity for me to be able to share with you a lot of information about blockchain technology and so you understand all the possibilities that are available with blockchain i am shortly going to go into the presentation itself at which point the camera is going to get a lot smaller you're still going to see me there and at some points i may actually turn off the camera to give you the best streaming experience so let me go into the presentation right now so i can actually share with you the contents that we will be presenting in this event so as i mentioned the the name of the event is Preparing for Success in a Post-COVID-19 World with Blockchain Technology. As we go through this presentation, what I want to point out to you is that a big part of the world is right now under lockdown. This is a very different environment from where the world used to be. This coronavirus has completely transformed many industries and many new opportunities have been opened up. A lot of people have been focusing on the challenges presented by coronavirus. But with blockchain technology, many new opportunities have opened up. And that's what I want to share with you, what is currently available, which you can take advantage of using blockchain technology. So let me speak to you right now about what we're going to be covering in the event. For starters, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is George Levy. I'm a certified senior blockchain professional and a certified Bitcoin professional. I am an instructor and division head for blockchain at Blocks EDU. I'm having the opportunity uh, to be able to speak to you thanks to this uh, opportunity with University Canada West. Uh, I've had a great opportunity to be able to present blockchain technology to senior leadership teams all around the world at many leading organizations that you might have heard about. Things such as Ernst & Young, Fannie Mae, which is the leading uh, mortgage industry in, uh, sorry, mortgage entity in the United States, um, dealing with the Ministry of Economy in Mexico. Blockchain technology is really entering in many areas. And as you will see in today's event, you will find that there are many possibilities with blockchain that many people are simply not aware of. So let me get into this so I can start presenting to you some of the contents that we're going to be going through. I would like to open up with an announcement that the United States Department of Homeland Security has established that blockchain is a COVID-19 critical service. What exactly do I mean by that? The key question is that there is a title known as blockchain managers and blockchain managers in the space of food and agriculture are considered critical infrastructure workers. As we go through this event, I will talk about how blockchain technology is actually being used in supply chain management. And it is a very, very important technology that right now helps power many of the supply chains around the world. So the managers that are actually managing those supply chains uh, using blockchain, the blockchain managers are considered critical infrastructure workers. Realize that this is a position that didn't exist prior to blockchain's creation. And when COVID-19 hit, their position rose to the top at, to such a level that the Department of Homeland Security considers them critical infrastructure workers. So let me explain to you some of the other key items I want to talk to you by going through the agenda of what we will cover today. I will begin the event with where are the blockchain jobs? And I'm doing that specifically because many people right now are concerned that the economy is soft. They're concerned that maybe there are no jobs. They may be thinking that their company is actually maybe shutting down. Some people are looking for new opportunities that may actually have more prevalence than dealing with a physical business that could be at any moment shut down. Uh, areas where this has actually been impacted, for example, if you were in the restaurant business or if you were in hospitality like hotels, um, there's there's many industries that right now are facing a lot of pressure because of coronavirus. However, there are many jobs that are being opened, and I'm going to give you some visibility into where these jobs are available. From there, I'm going to talk to you about the origin of blockchain. It's very important because when people talk about blockchain, many people don't know where blockchain came from. And I'm going to follow that with what is a blockchain? Because as a matter of fact, many of the people that are taking this event right now may not know what a blockchain is. You may have heard the term. It's a very hot buzzword. But what exactly is a blockchain? I'll get into that in that section. And when I'm done with that, I'm going to take you some next steps that you can take if you find that what I present to you today seems valuable and you would like to be able to capture more information and actually increase your skills and earn certificates that may be able to help you professionally. So as I go through this event, let me go uh, to some of the key items that I want to go through. 
And where are the blockchain jobs? Now, let's first start with who is hiring. Well, among them, there are startups. And let me get specific as to why there are so many jobs among startups. The fact is, there are over 1,500 cryptocurrency startups that have raised over $3.7 billion just in that using initial coin offerings. Now, many people may not know what initial coin offerings are. And in fact, initial coin offerings are a new way of raising funds that presents an alternative to initial public offerings. This didn't exist prior to cryptocurrency. In fact, what I would like to do right now is I'd like to point to you a, uh, a small poll just to get a pulse of who's actually here. And what I would like you to do is take a moment and answer that poll for me. You will see that on the right side of your screen, you will find an option to select which type of, uh, if you have any cryptocurrencies. And I want to know this because based on your responses, I'll be able to know how deep I should go on these topics. Now, if you'll notice, my options include zero cryptocurrencies, and that would mean you simply don't have any crypto. One, which would typically be Bitcoin. What I've learned is that when people have one cryptocurrency, yeah, it's usually Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the 900 pound gorilla in the room. Bitcoin is by far the largest market cap of all the cryptos but there are over 5,000 different cryptocurrencies. And that's why I'm presenting you options. So as you can see, I actually give you the option of no cryptocurrencies, one cryptocurrency, and then I go into two to four, five to 10, 11 or more. And I'm doing this intentionally because when I started teaching these courses and I actually got into the education space within blockchain and Bitcoin in 2016, my question always was, who here knows what Bitcoin is? And the fact is, hardly anybody raised their hand. I've had to change that because by now, most people know what Bitcoin is. It, Bitcoin is a digital, it's a cryptocurrency. It is the first decentralized cryptocurrency. And now my question goes into, it used to be who here has some Bitcoin? And then maybe one person would raise it. But the reason why you see that I present so many options is that I've had many students in many of the courses I presented that have 15 or more. In fact, I know somebody that has over 30 different cryptocurrencies. Now, let me close the poll right now and let's see exactly where we are. So what I can see from here is that the entire audience, the majority has no cryptocurrencies. However, we have about 13% that have two to four cryptos. And it's great to see there's actually 4% that actually has five or five to 10 cryptocurrencies. That's very, very good to know because it gives me some, uh, some substance to know how far I should go into this. So given that we have a lot of people that don't have any crypto, I'm actually going to go into detail so you understand exactly. And I'm going to take you right into what you need to know. And I know that the people that actually have more cryptocurrencies are still going to find this very valuable. So who else is in there? Legacy firms are actually hiring. And what I mean by that, many financial firms are actually hiring blockchain staff. The reason is Bitcoin presents a big threat to banks. As a matter of fact, Bitcoin, the original vision of Bitcoin was a bank killer. It eliminated the needs for banks. And you will be able to learn more about this as we go through this course. But the key point I want to point out to you is that banks are some of the most aggressive hires within the blockchain space. And that's because they're looking at this as an opportunity. If you go back for a second at the music industry, and, uh, and I don't know how far back because I don't know your age. What I can say, though, is that the music industry prior to the Internet was a massive I think it was actually about $40 billion a year. Um, it's either 20 or 20 or 40 billion. That's a lot of billion dollar industry, but it completely tanked after Napster came along. The reason why Napster took the business is because when somebody could just get a free song an MP3 for free over the internet, people just didn't buy songs anymore. So what did the music industry do? The music industry wanted to kill internet and they wanted to kill MP3s and ban them. Well, the banks have actually seen this. And they realize that they can't really fight Bitcoin. They can't really ban Bitcoin. It's impossible, actually. But what they can do is they can try to regulate it. They're going to try to try to find ways to get around it. But the truth is, the best thing they can do is leverage this blockchain technology. And banks are aggressively hiring people that actually know about blockchain skills. Let's go beyond that. In the healthcare industry, there's a huge move to moving towards electronic health records and actually placing medical records on the blockchain. One of the main reasons is because there's a lot of theft of medical records. And it's a real challenge to be able to keep all this highly sensitive information in a way that's secure. And blockchain presents a great alternative. And there's a lot of efforts in the healthcare industry to apply blockchain. 
beyond that, I want to talk about logistics and you will see logistics and supply chain are very closely tied. And what you will be seeing is in the coming years, it's already actively aggressively happening, but you will see more and more supply chains moving on to blockchain. Beyond that retail, what you will find is that many, uh, many stores and many different retail locations are actually applying blockchain across the systems. So you will see that as well. Reason why I want to tell you this is that getting a job in blockchain is not about just becoming a developer. There's many opportunities and having blockchain skills can help you among many of them. There are many marketers that are needed in the blockchain space financial that will work in the in the blockchain space there's a lot of things project managers that require blockchain skills so there's a lot of positions that require blockchain skills let me take you one further technology companies are some of the most aggressive hirers in the blockchain space microsoft has a huge huge hiring presence when it comes to blockchain in fact their azure uh, cloud system a lot of blockchain platforms are running on azure all their cloud platforms are powering um, block, many blockchain implementations. Beyond that, the same thing happens with IBM. As a matter of IBM, IBM actually has over a thousand positions currently uh, hiring blockchain personnel. IBM has a very, very strong presence in it, not only from the implementation of a uh, blockchain, but because many of these blockchain platforms are actually running on their cloud system. So what I've actually heard is that, and actually this is directly from IBM uh, consultants, one dollar in blockchain implementation translates into fifteen dollars worth of cloud services so when ibm looks at the blockchain opportunity they're looking at the big big system not just the blockchain development but how they can actually leverage their cloud uh infrastructure same thing is happening with google and with amazon both are actually very very aggressively hiring in the blockchain space so what i want to point out to you is that there are many different uh, companies and different types and profiles of businesses that are actually hiring in blockchain so as we continue through this, who's hiring as well? Governments. Let me take you back to the uh, Department of Homeland Security in the United States. And what you will find is that they actually have a full blockchain portfolio. As they state, blockchain and distributed ledgers, you're going to hear the term distributed ledger technology very often when you're talking about blockchain. As we go through this introductory course that we're going today, I will touch upon the distributed ledger technology concept. Okay. Their innovative technologies have many uses and applications across multiple sectors of the economy. So as you can see, automatically, the Department of Homeland Security is stating that blockchain and distributed ledger technology can be implemented across many different areas. Beyond that, Canada is very, very aggressively going into that space. And I'm going to be talking a little bit further, um, further along in the course about Ethereum. From the people that actually have two to four and the five to 10 cryptocurrencies, I'm pretty certain that odds are one of them may be Ethereum. And I'll talk about Ethereum further in the course. But Canada is actually the third most aggressively uh, implemented country globally in the blockchain space. So we've got the United States, we've got the UK, and we've got directly Canada is right up there. So top three, Canada is very, very aggressively in the space. And Canada is a leading blockchain country, exactly as I told you. So when it comes to uh, the United States, the UK, and then Canada, Canada is very aggressively pursuing blockchain. So if you really want to be on the cutting edge and you really want to be in all the new developments that are being done, blockchain is a great opportunity you should be looking at. So one thing that I do want to point out is that directly from LinkedIn, and you might be very familiar with LinkedIn, blockchain is the number one job skill for the year 2020. It's the number one most in-demand job skill across the industries. And the main reason is there's a huge lack of skilled talent. Now, think about it. If you have all these companies that have these plans to implement blockchain solutions and they don't have anybody to be able to implement those solutions, we have a huge talent gap. And that is the reason why LinkedIn points out that blockchain is the number one job skill for 2020. There simply is a huge gap. The people that can actually man all these positions for these new technologies that are being built on blockchain. So it's a very, very big opportunity for whoever can actually be prepared to take that on. So we've talked a lot about blockchain. Let's go to the origin of blockchain. So you really get the big picture of what we're talking about here. To be specific, everything started from the depths of the financial crisis. And I do this to put a little bit of drama into it because right in the middle at the bottom of the last financial crisis, Bitcoin was born. Now to be specific, we're talking about October 31st, 2008. 
Remember, there was a huge financial crisis. All the world's global financial markets were in nosedive. Many of the banks were going under. Banks were getting bailouts. It was a really horrible, horrible crisis globally in finances. And yet a white paper was published. That white paper was called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. That white paper described what Bitcoin would be. In fact, to be specific, the white paper was published on October 31st, 2008. And the first block on the Bitcoin blockchain was published on January 3rd, 2009. So the first block mined, which is the Genesis block, was mined on January 3rd, 2009. So you got to think about this. I'm talking to you about Bitcoin being born on January 3rd, 2009. And that specific block, the Genesis block from Bitcoin, is where blockchain was born. So let me tell you specifically what we're talking about. We're right now talking about Bitcoin. And what I want to point out to you is that the first lines of the Bitcoin white paper say a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. If you read between the lines, what that really is saying is you can send money to someone else without needing a financial institution. In other words, a bank, a credit card, or any other type of third party. Whenever I send Bitcoin to someone else, I'm doing that peer to peer. Now, if a Bitcoin, which is currently worth about $11,100 as of today, if I can send that directly over the internet to someone else without the services of a bank, why do you need a bank? So you see the opportunity and you see the threat to the financial system. So this is why Bitcoin is such a big deal because Bitcoin is a completely different way of being able to transfer value, that is money or a financial instrument over the internet without needing a third party, such as a bank, a credit card, or any other type of entity. So let me take you through what this really means in the grand scheme of things. The big idea is this, whenever you send money from one person to another over the World Wide Web, you need the services of a third party. That third party acts as a middleman. It's an intermediary partner that specifically handles the transaction. You cannot simply take X amount of Canadian dollars and actually put them in an email, attach them and send them to someone else. You need to use a third party, such as a bank transfer, such as PayPal, anything along those lines. You need that bank. You can't simply just attach money to an email and send it. Now, that third party controls that transfer. And think about the power of that. If that third party all of a sudden doesn't want to do business with you, they can close your account or they could reverse the payment. They could stop the payment. So the key thing is that there's a lot of power that you're giving to that third party to handle that monetary transaction that's going through. Not to mention, you still have to be very high fees to the, to the specific third party that is doing this. Now, in Bitcoin, it's a very different game. In Bitcoin, whenever you send Bitcoins to someone else, you send them directly, that is peer to peer, from one person to the other person directly. And that goes over the Bitcoin network, which is a network of thousands of computers all around the world. And the transaction is recorded using blockchain. Now, you notice how we get to blockchain. For Bitcoin to exist, you need to have blockchain. Blockchain is what records all those transactions that take place on Bitcoin. So you understand the blockchain technology is what captures all the transactions that are able to pass over Bitcoin and enable people to be able to send it directly peer to peer from one party to another. Now, the key reasons why this is important is that a Bitcoin transaction is disintermediated. It's a very important word for you to know. This intermediate basically means you're getting rid of the intermediary part. So in this case, you get rid of the banks. As I mentioned, Bitcoin was originally a bank killer. So with Bitcoin, you don't need that middle party. From there, Bitcoin is also distributed. As I mentioned, the Bitcoin network is a network of thousands of computers all around the world. And every one of those computers has an identical copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. It's distributed. It's all around the world. As a result, there's not a single point of failure. Think about the power of that. You may have heard about banks getting hacked. You may have heard about a visa being taken offline. If you actually have a centralized server and you can hack that server, you basically bring down visa, you bring down a bank. 
But if you can actually do a distributed network like Bitcoin is, a network of, of tens of thousands of computers all around the world that basically carry all this information and an identical copy of the Bitcoin blockchain all around the world, there's not a single point of failure. That is one of the key powers of Bitcoin. The Bitcoin network hasn't been down since it's been launched. It actually has had a 99.999% uptime, which is actually incredible. Now, key things I want to point out to you from this whole thing is that Bitcoin is also known as being decentralized. The key point about Bitcoin and why it's so important that it's decentralized is that no one really owns Bitcoin. And I'm not saying you don't own a Bitcoin. I'm saying no one owns the Bitcoin network. As a matter of fact, I actually have a Bitcoin full node running in my house. I didn't need to have asked permission to do that. I just downloaded open source software. I connected my computer and that computer keeps an, a full copy of the Bitcoin blockchain in my computer. I pay for that. But just like me, there's a network of thousands of other people worldwide that run computers and have a full copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. We are all part of this Bitcoin network. But notice there is no Bitcoin CEO that had to authorize me to run a full node in my house. There's no Bitcoin CEO with an on off switch that could just turn the whole thing off. That's the power of decentralization and why Bitcoin is so powerful. There is no centralized entity that could turn around and basically say, shut it down. This is very, very important, especially in many areas where right now there's challenges with local money. I'll give you an example, Venezuela. Venezuela right now has a huge problem with inflation. There has been so much of their local currency printed that it's practically worthless. So what people have been doing is doing as much as they can to switch from the local currency onto Bitcoin to be able to preserve their value. So you see, Bitcoin is serving as a hedge to protect their monetary value by moving away from their local currency onto Bitcoin. And because Bitcoin is decentralized, they're able to get away with it without actually having the local governments actually shutting them down. So a big, big, big... Uh, alternative that without Bitcoin would not be available. So let me go one step further with one of the key concepts in Bitcoin, which is what is known as being trustless. Now, trustless is important because whenever I do a transaction to someone else using a bank, I have to trust that my bank will actually give the transaction and pass it through. I have to fully put my trust on a third party and that third party will complete that transaction. Now, you may have had a problem where perhaps you actually had a check that either bounced or you had a problem with a payment not getting through. Well, you had to trust that your bank will actually make that happen. When it comes to Bitcoin, you don't have to trust it because it's trustless. I don't have to trust that the Bitcoin network will do this. It is all mathematically built into the software that runs Bitcoin. So this concept of trustless is very important. Now, when we go beyond that, the key reason why that is, is that blockchain itself is sometimes called specifically programmable trust. The transfer of an asset using blockchain is built using mathematics that determine that an asset will change from one owner to another owner. And the mathematics is what actually guarantees that the transaction will be done. Every transaction in Bitcoin is recorded on the blockchain. And we can look back as early as the first transaction that ever took place in Bitcoin we can see it on the Bitcoin blockchain. As a matter of fact, let me take you right now to that one transaction because it's actually a very exciting thing to see. So I will take you right now to here. And what you're seeing here is a block explorer. A block explorer is a platform that enables you to see the contents of what's recorded on a blockchain. So in this case, what we're looking at is as a Bitcoin block explorer. And what you're seeing here is the first transaction that ever took place on Bitcoin. That transaction actually took place on January 3rd, 2009. And when we go down, you will find that there's a hidden message inside it. The Times, 03 Jan, 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. This was a call out with the first block that was ever uh, mined on Bitcoin saying, banks, you're getting bailouts, but the average person is not. And Bitcoin presented an alternative. So this is why Bitcoin is so important. Because what you have is a full source of truth that is programmed and you have it all the way back to the first transaction that ever happened in Bitcoin. In fact, you can actually go all the way to the latest block of transactions right now and they're all recorded on Bitcoin. So from right now, what you see here, the latest block that happened in Bitcoin is 641,363. That's how many blocks have been mined on Bitcoin since Bitcoin started. 
And yet, as you can see here, this one transaction was on block zero. So you see, every single transaction that has been recorded on Bitcoin is recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain. This is very, very important for you to know because as we go through this course and as you go through future courses, this whole idea of being able to have a permanent record of every single transaction that has ever taken place is one of the key reasons why Bitcoin and blockchain are such important technologies. So let me take you right now to at, uh, take a look at the at Bitcoin at work. And I actually wanted to do this. Um, so I'm going to take you to a view. And I think I'm actually going to turn off my camera for a moment so that you can actually view this animation. This is actually real time. This is a real time view of transactions taking place in Bitcoin all around the world. What you're seeing is every single transaction that you're seeing here across the world. You're seeing transactions in Dallas, in Washington, you're seeing in uh, Santa Clara, but you're going to start seeing different countries as well. And what you're seeing is all of these transactions are happening right now and you're watching them in real time. This is Bitcoin moving around the world, moving billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin every single day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this is the power of being able to have these types of technologies because Bitcoin never sleeps. I'll give you a perfect example. I actually had to deal a, I had to do a bank transaction for a payment that I had to do for a check. And it was actually happening on a Sunday. Well, my banks are closed on Sundays and I could not get a certified check. Well, if I would have been able to pay with Bitcoin, I would have been able to do that transaction. Unfortunately, I couldn't make a payment for the kind of level that I wanted um, with just a personal check. I needed to have a certified check, but the banks are closed on Sunday. However, I have seen many transactions on Bitcoin worth millions and millions of dollars and they're transferred directly peer to peer. This is the power of Bitcoin that I want you to consider. This is happening right now all around the world. So I want to take you a little bit further so you understand more about this technology by getting into what is a blockchain. I hope that by now you're starting to understand that this technology that you're seeing, uh, Bitcoin is only one application of blockchain. So let's get into what is a blockchain. And I'm going to bring back my camera again because uh, I no longer have that animation going. So let's get into what is a blockchain. I'm going to give you very, very easily what the main idea behind a blockchain is, okay? Whenever you do a transaction of an asset of value, something of value, like, for example, selling a house or selling a car or selling a, a fancy work of art or anything that's actually worth money, you need to make sure that the transaction actually has certain elements. The first one is you need to agree on the terms between the parties involved. And not only that, you need to make sure that once that transaction is completed, that it is final. Now, understand the importance of this, because if you have a system where a transaction can be done and then someone can turn around and imply that the transaction didn't happen, then you really don't have a transaction. So to be able to actually have a transaction of value, you need to make sure that you agree on the terms of it. And second of all, that once that is completed, that it is final. So. The reason why I want to tell you this is that now we're going to start talking about blockchain in the concept of ledgers. So remember that I talked to you about blockchain being spoken about as a distributed ledger and having distributed ledger technology. This is the easiest way of looking at what a blockchain is. Whenever you can do a transaction and a transfer of an asset of value, instead of having two parties, each one with a separate ledger, keeping track of that transaction, perfect example would be, Say, for example, you want to send some money from your bank to another bank. Your bank needs to take, a, take that transaction, record it into their database, and then you might, for instance, send a check. That check will make it to the second bank. That bank will then update their own database to reflect that they received money from the other bank, and they put it in their own database. You understand? There's separate ledgers, and each one of the banks has a separate ledger of what actually happened in that transaction. This is how the world currently works. This is why whenever you issue a check to someone else, you have to wait until that check clears. You can't simply just give a check to someone else and automatically assume that the money's there. You may have experienced the fact that you might have gotten paid for a service, and then you go and you start writing checks against the money you have in your bank because you think you got paid, and then you find out a couple of days later that that check actually had no funds. 
then you get stuck with that insufficient funds uh, transaction. This is the problem with having separate ledgers. And the entire world is built right now on having separate ledgers, which are controlled by centralized entities. Bank A has their database, which is actually your bank accounts. And then Bank B has their own databases, which is the bank accounts of whoever your customers may be or whoever you're paying. You understand the separation of these ledgers? So as we go through these, these are prone to errors. Huge problem with errors because, say, for example, Bank B may actually report a transaction as being $4,000, but in fact, you sent $5,000. There's a possibility of an error along that. Let's go to one other error, tampering. Well, what if that second person actually wants to cheat and wants to actually change the transaction value and say that you received less money than what you did? or for some other reason, change the timing of it so that they can work something around. There's a lot of ways that things can be tampered with. And this is a big, big problem when you're dealing with financials as well as many sensitive other datas because the date of when a transaction was recorded could completely, completely render void a contract. So you understand how important it is that the information that's recorded in these uh, ledgers is accurate. An error could cause a big problem. Furthermore, one of these could be deleted. As I mentioned, if you actually have a centralized server and that server gets hacked and the database is destroyed, all of a sudden that information is lost forever. So having separate ledgers presents many challenges, among them having errors, tampering, and being deleted. Now, this is the pre-blockchain approach. When we're talking about a blockchain, and by the way, the information could also be lost. Let's go to a blockchain. And what we really do in that case is instead of having two separate ledgers, we actually have a single ledger and that ledger is shared. So understand when you're doing a distributed ledger technology, what you have is you have a single ledger and it's distributed. It's shared across multiple parties. So that ledger is shared across parties. Furthermore, as I mentioned, the information is distributed. You not only have that one ledger that both parties would actually be recording on, there are multiple copies of that ledger all around the world. As I mentioned in the case of Bitcoin, there are thousands of copies of the Bitcoin blockchain all around the world. And this is where distributed ledger technology is so powerful because you don't have a single point of failure. You actually have a ledger that everybody agrees with, but furthermore, you have multiple copies of that ledger around the world. So there's no single point of failure. This is the key concept behind blockchain and why sometimes blockchain is also referred to as distributed ledger technology. So the information once it's recorded on a blockchain is permanent. As I showed you, that first transaction that I showed you that showed that first transaction on Bitcoin, the first first transaction ever is permanently recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain. You can't change that. It will be there permanently. Additionally, the information in there is immutable. Immutable means that you cannot change it. Now, this is a good thing if you want to make sure the information is recorded and you keep the integrity of it. It also presents some challenges because sometimes you may want to change that information, but that's something we could discuss in future lessons. The key point is that for you to understand what a blockchain really is, a blockchain is a single ledger that's shared and distributed in which all the records are recorded in a permanent and immutable way. And that is the key concept of what a blockchain is. Future lessons will actually get far into detail, far further into detail, but this is the first top level approach of what blockchain technology is. And when we talk about these cryptocurrencies, as I mentioned, there's over 5,000 of them. There are blockchains for many of these cryptocurrencies. There's a blockchain for Ethereum. There's a blockchain for Litecoin. There's a blockchain for Dash, blockchain for Monero. There's a blockchain for so many other ones that, that you could really just get into it. Zcash. Um, not just Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV, all of those are different blockchains. And each one of those blockchains for the individual cryptocurrencies keeps a record of every single transaction that has taken place in that cryptocurrency all the way back to the first crypto uh, transaction ever. So let me get you into some more details right now, talking about the evolution of blockchain. So far, we've talked about Bitcoin. And, and I showed you Bitcoin hard at work and we saw how we have the world. There's all these transactions happening around the world. But Bitcoin is only the first generation of a blockchain. Bitcoin, in fact, is only one application of blockchain. And blockchain is now being used across many different applications, which we will be getting into further context in this lesson, just in this introduction. So you understand how deeply ingrained blockchain is and how many possibilities are available for you.
So let's talk specifically about the second generation. And the second generation is actually Ethereum. Ethereum was actually created and a white paper was launched in 2013 describing the vision for Ethereum. Now, Ethereum is a very, very important blockchain because Canada is a big reason why Ethereum is here. And the reason is because of a gentleman called Vitalik Buterin. Now, Vitalik is worth over $100 million right now. And as a matter of fact, he was worth considerably more when the price of Ethereum was a lot higher. But still, as of this moment, he's worth around $100 million. In fact, it might be higher right now because Bitcoin and Ethereum have actually been on a tear up. The price of Bitcoin has been rising quite a bit and so has Ethereum. But there are key reasons why I want to point out to you, but this is important, is that Vitalik is the co-founder of Ethereum. And he was born in Russia, but he grew up in Canada. He actually went to Waterloo. Uh, key things I will tell you, he actually went to Waterloo. He didn't graduate, but he basically did go to Waterloo. Um, but he's a very, very good developer. And he came up with the vision for Ethereum. Now, notice he was born in 1994, so he's a young guy. And he's worth over $100 million. But he created Ethereum using this blockchain technology. And what he developed was actually a software that's global and open source. Anybody can download the software. Anybody can use it. Same with Bitcoin. You can actually download the Bitcoin software because it's fully open source and you can build upon it. Now, with Ethereum, the vision for Ethereum is to create what's known as a platform for dApps. A dApp or dApp is decentralized application. Now, a decentralized application is a different way of looking at computer programs. For example, I could run software on my computer running on Windows, but I can build an application that runs on Ethereum. And anybody can access it from around the world. As a matter of fact, I have multiple applications that I run on, on Ethereum, which I use. Let me give you an example right now. First, let me go into the full vision of the world's programmable blockchain, because that's what the vision for Ethereum is. I'm going to give you an example right now of one of the programs that actually runs on Ethereum. This is actually a very, very special program for me. It's called CryptoKitties. Now, CryptoKitties are actually digital collectibles. These are digital assets that are built on Ethereum. This is my CryptoKitty truth seeker. It's only one of my CryptoKitties. As a matter of fact, I have many others. Um, but all of these are digital assets that I own. In fact, I can breed them. So I'll give you an example. Um, Satoshi Katamoto is the father of my precious Obcat, uh, which by the way is one blockchain at a time. But all of these, like this C is actually a crypto kitty that my daughter owns. But what's interesting about these assets is that one of these crypto kitties sold for over $100,000. Now realize what we're talking about here. This is a digital collectible that can be just as valuable as a Bitcoin. A Bitcoin is worth $11,100 at this moment. It's been worth up to $20,000 at one point. At one point, it was worth zero. But the point is this. It is a digital asset which has a value to it. Same thing with CryptoKitties. But CryptoKitties don't run on the Bitcoin blockchain. They run on Ethereum. And this entire platform, CryptoKitties, is actually open source and runs on Ethereum. So you could develop your own decentralized application run it on Ethereum and run your own business. You don't have to have servers. The whole thing runs on top of Ethereum. So this is the kind of things that you're going to be able to learn once you get into blockchain development. You could build your own CryptoKitties. As a matter of fact, the source code for CryptoKitties is available. You can download it. You can actually create a variation of CryptoKitties. Um, let me take you to state of the dApps. So stateofthedapps.com is a very popular website where you can actually see many of these decentralized applications. But notice, this is a whole marketplace of decentralized applications that actually run on top of Ethereum. I've, I consider it very, very similar to, for example, the app store that runs on your mobile devices, only this is an app store that actually runs on people that actually have Ethereum. So I can actually run, and it doesn't have to be just Ethereum. You can actually see there are many other uh you have different dApps that are running on many different uh, platforms. So here's some platforms. You can see there's Ethereum, but there's also EOS. You actually have uh, POA. You've got GoChain, Blockstack, Tron. There's all these different platforms where you can run decentralized applications. And all of these use blockchain technology. So you understand the opportunity, how big we're getting now. It's not just Bitcoin. It's not just supply chain. Now we're talking about decentralized applications. And as I mentioned, I have CryptoKitties. But there are many other things that actually run. 
You can see different games. You can see applications that you can actually like business applications. All of these were actually built. And these are business models. I actually paid for many of my crypto kitties. And as a matter of fact, I actually could turn around and sell my crypto kitties. So these are assets that I actually own. And I can even pull them off of crypto kitties and I can actually move them over to a different platform and actually sell them as an asset. Just like I could sell a house, just like I could sell a car or a valuable painting in my house, I can sell my crypto kitty. That's why I was telling you about this crypto kitty called Genesis. Genesis was worth over $100,000 and a very, very valuable crypto kitty. So let me continue with the presentation because all of this was made possible by Vitalik Buterin. And Vitalik actually is a, he's actually spends a lot of time in Canada, but he's actually a global citizen by now. Um, very important person, but Canada has played a huge port, uh, huge part of what has been the development of blockchain technology. So let me continue with this, with the, uh, the evolution of blockchain. So we talked about the second generation being block uh, Ethereum, but there are more. There's NEO, there's IOTA, there's Ethereum. Uh, sorry, we mentioned Ethereum, but we've got Hyperledger. Hyperledger is a, a platform right now. IBM is very actively involved in Hyperledger development, actually Hyperledger Fabric, because there's many different Hyperledgers. But Hyperledger Fabric is a very popular blockchain platform. That's a third generation. And it's used in many enterprise situations. Companies such as Walmart use uh, Guy Four use uh, Hyperledger blockchain. So let me continue with you and give you some more information on this. And I hope you're finding this valuable. And I may get a little bit excited because none of this was available before Bitcoin. And these are multi-billion dollar opportunities that simply we're still very early on in the opportunity for whoever gets to take advantage of it. So let me give you some context of some of the sectors that blockchain will change. And you'll see the wide variety of them. We've spoken about a few of them. We've talked about banking and payments. Um, we talked about uh, cloud storage. As I mentioned, that IBM is actually very heavily involved in it because they're making a lot of money with cloud. Um, but things such as charity. Right now, um, there is a group of about 500,000 Jordanian uh, refugees, Syrian refugees, that are right now receiving their... Um, their United Nations uh, charitable assistance on the Ethereum blockchain. They're actually being able to receive charitable help using blockchain technology. The reason they're doing that is because the problem with many of these charities is that a lot of money gets lost in middlemen and a lot of money is stolen. But you're actually able to keep a clear, permanent, and immutable record of every single transaction. It gives a lot more transparency to the entire process. There are millions of dollars that are being saved. It's actually being used also in voting. I'll give you a perfect example. Whenever you cast your vote, there's a lot of discussion about voter fraud. Well, you could have somebody cast a vote twice, or you could have somebody, for example, send a, a mail-in ballot to someone else and then cast a vote incorrectly for someone else. But think about it and replace a Bitcoin for a vote. So instead of actually casting a vote, you could have the equivalent of, say, a Bitcoin, but it's actually a digital token that you control. And once you spend it, you already cast your vote. Now, the only person that could actually cast that vote would be you because you're the only person that has the cryptographic keys to be able to control that vote that gets spent. You see how all this technology is tying in? That's what I want to put to you in the context. This is a brand new technology with many possibilities, but it's so early on that there are many, many opportunities for the people that are prepared to take them on. So let me get into one specific factor just to put things uh, crystal clear here, because this is one of the areas where it is most actively being used today. Supply chain management. Now, if you're not familiar with supply chain, it is all the steps involved in getting a product from the raw material to the customer. Whenever you buy anything, whether it's a bag of chips or whether you buy a cell phone, whether you buy a car, there's a supply chain. You have to get all the way from the raw materials, those raw materials need to make it to the suppliers. The suppliers then give the materials to the manufacturers who create the products. Then the products are passed over to the distributors, which then distribute it over to the retailers, and eventually the customers buy it. Do you understand? Those supply chains are what keep the global economy going. So perhaps during the coronavirus pandemic, you might have experienced that there were shortages of some key items. For example, I live in the United States. There was a big, big problem at the beginning of the lockdown where there was no toilet paper. Big problem with that. But it wasn't just toilet papers. Cleaning supplies were gone out. Supply chains were really having a very difficult time handling all of this new scenario of what was going on. So when supply chains fail, customers are not able to get products. And as a result, 
businesses also are not able to sell their products. This is why supply chains are so important. Now, going into this, I want to tell you some of the key challenges right now that are facing supply chain management and why blockchain is so important in these. Number one, when you're dealing in blockchain, sorry, when you're dealing in supply chain, you have multiple separate players. You've got in the raw materials, it might be a farmer. Then, for example, you're going to a supplier. A supplier has to buy from the farmer, and then that supplier has to send over to somebody which would process the vegetables. You understand there are different players along the way, and each one of those players has a separate ledger keeping track of every transaction. You understand now when we go back to the vision of the blockchain, if you have so many different players along the way and each one has a separate layer, you have many opportunities to have fraud, opportunities for tampering, opportunities for data to get lost, opportunities for human error. All of these separate ledgers cause problems. So there's multiple separate players which present some huge problems for these supply chains, including lack of transparency. Somebody may be actually receiving supplies and then simply not report that every single piece that they received and they only pass off a single you know, portion of what they actually received. So there's a lot of ways where people can actually tamper with it and actually steal or be able to hide results. So lack of transparency is a huge problem. I'll go one step further. There are discrepancies in records. And you can think about how difficult it may be if all of a sudden your records show that you should have received, say, 50,000 copies of a specific product, and then all of a sudden you only receive 20, right? So discrepancies in records present big, big problems. And these come many times from the multiple separate players. There's limited cross-process visibility. I determine this as if you're at the top of the supply chain, and I'm going to talk to you specifically about Walmart, because Walmart is very aggressively using blockchain technology. If you're at the at the CFO level or you're at the chief operations officer level or you're actually at the VP of uh, the VP of produce, that person needs to know where all the produce is. But if there are multiple specific databases that say I have X amount of avocados here or there's X amount of you know mangoes in this other place, there's multiple different databases along the place. There's a very difficult problem of seeing where exactly is the produce. It can go across the board from any other products as well. So there's also a key challenge with globalization. As the world becomes more and more globalized, many of these suppliers are coming from many different parts around the world. Well, those parts around the world also have their own databases. And then you have to keep track of where a specific product is anywhere. One thing I will tell you about Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, you can see the exact location of every single Bitcoin that has ever existed in Bitcoin because every single transaction is permanently and immutably recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain. Same thing applies to supply chain. If you actually have a supply chain built on top of, you, on top of blockchain, you can see at any precise second where a specific asset is across the entire supply chain. You see the power of this technology? Key things as, such as maintaining high performance is a big problem too. As I mentioned, during the coronavirus pandemic, there was a huge problem because many of the products were simply not making it to the stores. And that actually not only affects the businesses that are not able to sell their products, but you also have the problem that the customers can't get their products. So there's a big problem as well with counterfeiting. And I want to drill down specifically on this because, as I mentioned, this is all about how blockchain is actually helping all the challenges in COVID-19. The fact is that according to the World Health Organization, approximately 10 to 30 medicine in developing countries is counterfeit. Think about how painful it would be if you're actually trusting your life on a medicine that you're receiving and the medicine is counterfeit. Blockchain has a perfect solution for that. In fact, the report by the United Nations states that counterfeit goods and fraudulent medicines pose a serious risk to public health and safety. I'm going to give you a complete um, point out in this one. Whenever you track medicine on the blockchain, you actually have a cryptographically secure record of that medicine. Let's replace that with a Bitcoin. There's no such thing as a counterfeit Bitcoin. You either have a Bitcoin or you do not have a Bitcoin. You can't just counterfeit a Bitcoin. You either have a Bitcoin and you give it to someone else or not. Same thing when you have a, a medicine and that medicine is certified to be actually a, a valid, authentic prescription, you can translate that into a digital token that makes its way through the supply chain. And all of this will be covered in future lessons, but I want you to get the big vision of how blockchain ties into all of this. So in this middle of this coronavirus pandemic, perhaps 10 to 30% of the medicines that are actually being given out in these developing countries 
might actually be counterfeit. So I just want to give you one key example that's very important to me is uh, Frank Yanis. Frank Yanis is a deputy commissioner for the Food Policy and Response at the Food and Drug Administration of the United States. The reason why I, why I want to bring up uh, Frank is that Frank is the former VP Food Safety Walmart. I know Frank well. Frank is a friend of mine. And uh, he's one of the true visionaries when it comes to blockchain. He actually implemented blockchain at Walmart before blockchain was cool. So he was one of the very, very early guys that actually brought blockchain into the equation. Now, he implemented blockchain in the food product supply chain, and he proved how he could reduce the time to track a mango from seven days to only 2.2 seconds. And let me tell you why that's so important. Um, last year, there was actually some major problems with E. coli contamination in lettuce. Over 100 people in the United States actually got sick. There were several deaths but there was no way of finding out exactly where the lettuce came from. And that's a big, big problem because if you can't find where the lettuce came from, you have to throw out all the lettuce because it's guilty until proven innocent. So think about it. If you're Walmart and it will take you seven days to find out where lettuce came from, you can't risk that when you have millions of customers. So you have to throw out all the lettuce because you simply have no way of knowing where the lettuce came from. However, if you can find out in a matter of seconds where the lettuce came from, you simply take that batch and you take it off the table. You don't have to throw out all the lettuce. So the reason why I want to tell you is the power of the efficiencies of being able to have these supply chains running on blockchain is massive. And this is the key reason why you're seeing that the Department of Homeland Security has said that blockchain managers in food and agriculture are considered essential critical infrastructure workers because blockchain managers control these blockchains. And it's these blockchains that are able to determine where the source of different products come in a matter of seconds. So when we go back, and this is one of the things that Frank always talks about, is traceability. How do you actually have traceability knowing where all your food came from? This is very different from being able to prevent food contaminations. The fact is, it's a given that there will be contaminated batches of food. The problem is, how do you identify where they came from and take them out of the food supply and then have a safer food supply? So I'm bringing you all these concepts so you understand how all of this ties into blockchain. So the key reasons why I'm bringing you all this is that I want to take you right now to some of the, the concrete results. According to IBM, this is the former CEO, we estimate that the application of blockchain to the global supply chains can result in more than $100 billion in efficiencies and improves, improvements in provenance and traceability of pharmaceuticals and food. Notice how many areas we're talking about. And remember, when we started, we were talking about Bitcoin, and Bitcoin has to deal with financial instruments. One Bitcoin is worth around $11,000 right now. But we're no longer talking Bitcoin. Now we're talking about food. Now we're talking about pharmaceuticals. You understand how many areas blockchain is actually being involved in. So in, the, in Canada, blockchain has actually been adopted by Canadian banks to verify client identities. So these are concrete examples, which I'm bringing to you so you understand how actively blockchain is making its way into, into Canada and how many opportunities are available. So I want to bring you all this whole concept because at this moment, if you wish, there's a platform which you can play with at mipasa.org. So this is just a project that you might want to take on, and uh, I didn't think that I would bring it up, but just so you understand, mipasa.org is a blockchain platform which is used to provide visibility across multiple different players as applied to COVID-19. So what mipasa.org has done is loaded up multiple data sets across uh, multiple players to be able to provide a single source of truth for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So think about it. The vision for Mipasa is a multi-party, multi-source, verifiable data sharing platform. Just like right now, I can go on Bitcoin and go to a block explorer and actually see where any Bitcoin transaction has come. If you go to Mipasa.org, you can see all these different data sets all in one location, and you can have all these parties in one single source of truth. Same visibility of what you're seeing, for example, when Walmart uses their food supply chain. They want to find out where their mangoes are they can see the entire picture because all of it is being tracked on top of blockchain. So as we're getting to the end of this event, I actually want to give you some opportunities for you to be able to continue learning. I hope you have found this course valuable, but there are multiple other opportunities which you can take to continue the learning process. As a matter of fact, there's a full agenda of workshop schedules which you can participate in. There's five workshops in a row. Each of these is two hours in length. And these are a lot deeper 
into the topics that we've spoken about. So for example, when I talk to you about the introduction to blockchain, I will literally walk you through the process of a blockchain. I will put you inside a blockchain. You'll be able to see a demo blockchain, which you can play with as well, and see exactly how cryptography ties into the equation. How are blockchains assembled? What does a block look like? All of that will be covered in the introduction to blockchain. From there, we will move on to blockchain networks. As I mentioned, Bitcoin is only one application of blockchain, and there are multiple other networks that use blockchain. We will cover that in that lesson. From there, we will go into blockchain platforms. As I mentioned, we got Bitcoin, but there's other platforms. You can go into Ethereum, you can go into Hyperledger. You'll be talking about other ones, R3 Corda. There's many blockchain platforms, and we will cover that in that course. We will then go into cryptocurrencies and the digital economy. Now, the reason why I make the distinction between cryptocurrencies and the digital economy is because they are two separate entities. Cryptocurrencies is one aspect. There's actually a cryptocurrency global market. But there's also the digital economy, and there's many other assets that are actually part of the digital economy. I'll give you a perfect example. Right now, Christie's, which is actually the, the art uh, house that actually does all the different uh, auctions, they're actually tracking their auctions on blockchain. And when you buy a multi-million dollar piece, you also get a blockchain verified certificate with your piece. If you sell that piece, you have to issue the certificate. That way you will know that the person that actually bought that piece is actually the true genuine owner. You understand the power of this? There's a huge problem with counterfeit art, but if you can certify a work of art and actually assign a digital token to that work of art by building a blockchain verified certificate for that art piece, you can create the value for that piece. So the digital economy is a huge uh, component. And the final piece that I would like to take you is the final one is called the future of blockchain challenges and opportunities. In that course, we will be getting into multiple opportunities in blockchain beyond merely blockchain. Blockchain is just one technology, but how does blockchain apply into artificial intelligence, internet of things, big data? There's so many different uh, areas where blockchain technology is intersecting, and we will cover that in this specific uh, lesson. So. The participants for these workshops will earn a certificate of completion from University of Canada West for each full workshop that you complete. Furthermore, all the workshops will be available online to the participants for 48 hours after the live event. So you can continue to go back and research again all the information that you've seen. Additionally, the workshops can be taken individually or as a pathway to get a certificate of achievement for completing all five workshops. And you'll receive that from the Canadian College of Technology and Business. So if you really wanna add a very valuable certificate to your LinkedIn profile, you wanna add it to your resume, you can actually earn that certificate of achievement by taking all five workshops. It's a very valuable, valuable certificate that you can add to your business profile. If you wanna learn more, I encourage you to visit youcanwest.ca slash short courses slash blockchain dash workshop. And I'll be leaving this more valuably for you as we're coming upon the end of this uh, workshop. I wanna also let you know that if you're interested and you have any questions, you can also contact short course at youcanwest.ca for additional information. I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I hope genuinely that this has been a valuable course for you. This is a very near and dear topic for me as we are changing the world one blockchain at a time. And if we use this technology properly, we're bound to make the world a better place for everyone. This is why I'm so excited that you actually took this course and that you'll take this opportunity to learn more about blockchain technology and help these visions actually happen. As I mentioned, there's a huge talent gap right now, and many companies want to be able to deliver on these blockchain powered visions. However, there's nobody to be able to deliver on those visions. So this presents a big opportunity as many new jobs are created for people that have blockchain skills. Again, I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity of being your instructor. I'm George Levy. This event has been presented by University Canada West and powered by Block CDU. Thank you very much, and I wish you an excellent day.